All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the next uh, seminar. Today we have Tarek Nathmaiti, he's from the Indian Institute of Science at, at Bangalore. Um, so Tarek is, is an expert on um, direct uh, on dark matter searches, in particular indirect dark matter searches, which he, he's going to tell us about today. Um, and, and Tarek is uh, notable of, uh, for this audience as well because uh, he is uh, the new um, postdoc, one of the new postdocs that we're hiring uh, via the Dark Matter Center of Excellence. And uh, currently going through the visa process at the moment, but hopefully he'll be arriving uh, in around September this year. So we'll be able to see him in person then, but, but for now let's we have a nice uh, virtual seminar from, from Tarek. So um, thanks for uh, being with us, Tarek, and, and uh, take it away. Yeah, okay. Thanks, thanks for the introduction and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So as the title says, I'll be talking about uh, indirect searches for heavy dark matter. Uh, and in index searches, what you do is you look at the favorable patches of the sky, and expectation is that their dark matter may annihilate or decay. To um, my voice is clear, right? Um, it, it's it's mm -hmm. sort of clear. It it could be a bit, bit better. Uh, do you have a different microphone, like the computer microphone, or okay, just just look, check? Um, there's at least one other microphone open, and I think we're getting an echo. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just just, just give me a second. Out. Just give me a second. Just give me a second. Okay. Okay. Everyone else is muted now. <laughs> we can uh, we can cut this out of the recording, by the way. So don't worry. Yes. Uh, that's better. Is it yeah. better now? Is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, much that's better. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, so yeah. Specifically, what I'll be talking about is uh, indirect searches for heavy dark matter, dark matter mass in hundreds and hundreds of TV and, and PV range, and I'll be talking about searches for those dark matter through uh, observation of gamma rays and neutrinos. Uh, in the first part of my talk, I'll be talking about uh, uh, the Tibet A S gamma observation, which has actually observed sub PV gamma rays, sub PV diffuse gamma rays from the galactic disk. This is first observation of such sub PV gamma rays. So in the first part of my talk, uh, we'll try to explore whether that observation could be used to search for dark matter or not. And in the next part, I'll be looking at uh, neutrinos that would be produced from dark matter capture in a galactic population of neutron star and observation of those neutrinos in experiments like Ice Cube and Chem uh, uh, And we'll see that uh, by looking at such scenario, we will be able to probe a uh, new region for the dark matter parameter space. Uh, this talk is based on these two paper. The first one is done in collaboration with Akasa V second Ranjan, and second one is with Devojit and my advisor. So let me get started with this uh, traditional slide for the dark matter. So as is well known, uh, uh, about 27% of the energy budget of the universe is made up of dark matter. And the evidence for dark matter comes from galactic to extragalactic to cosmological length scale. And importantly, all this, uh, I mean, th this is gravitational evidence. And importantly, the point here is that observations are actually quite independent in nature. Uh, so what we know is dark matter is there, but we don't know what it is made of. Uh, uh, we, we know it's, it should have certain properties, like it, it, it could be cold uh, in the sense that it velocity should be much much smaller than the uh, age of the sorry much much smaller than the velocity of the light. Uh, so that's why it's non-relativistic. Having said that, there are certain scenarios where it could be kind of warm, which is neither uh, relativistic nor non-relativistic. So in that sense, uh, I mean there are scenarios where you can have like warm dark matter. Uh, it it must be stable because. Uh, if, if it is not stable, then such a huge amount of matter uh, would not be there in the universe. Uh, so it has to be stable in the cosmological uh, time scale. Uh, it has to be massive because that's how we get to know about it. Uh, and the uh, allowed mass range is actually quite uh, large. It's almost 90 hours of magnitude is allowed. Uh, there is this proton mass and um, broadly in this range, you have this weakly interacting massive particles and below the sub GB range, there's a sub GB dark matter which are of current interest and also like this ultra light dark matter action and other things. Uh, so in this talk, what I'll be talking about is this 
dark matter mass in hundreds of dv and dv scale. So the assumption that I'm making over here is that dark matter is in this mass range and dark matter is talking to standard model state in some way or other. Uh, and there are uh, there are large class of models in the literature uh, which actually uh, I mean particle physics model which actually predicts such AB dark matter. So so the assumption is dark matter is in the uh, TB or PB scale and it is talking to standard model state in some way or other. So we are going to see how to prove that such such AB dark matter uh, in the collider. So what you do is uh, you collide two standard model state to produce let's say some uh, uh, some dark matter signature like uh, through uh, missing energy or through some missing energy plus monojet signature and other things. But given that the, I'm talking about dark matter mass in hundreds of TB and PB range, uh, so current collider energy is at 13 TB. So it, it would be kinematically disfavored to produce such heavy particles. And in direct detection, what you do is measure the recoil of the standard model. I mean, your expectation is dark matter may come and interact with uh, some st uh, standard model states. And there you measure the uh, recoil of the some standard model states in, uh, in an underground detector. And, and then by measuring that recoil, you predict about dark matter kinematics and mass cross section and other things. Uh, but as you know, this local dark matter density is fixed. So if you increase the dark matter mass, uh, the dark matter flux is going to decrease. So in that sense, the sensitivity of the direct detection, direct detection experience is actually uh, going to decrease, typically going to decrease. Uh, so that that's why I mean in in direct detection you could probe it, but the cross section that you might probe there is uh, not uh, not small cross sections uh, or not a small uh, standard model dark matter coupling. Uh, the, so having said that, there are there there is actually recent result by deep collaboration which has actually uh, uh, looked at the uh, direct direct searches for heavy dark matter. Uh, Again, that the cross section that they are proving is quite large. Uh, so, so you left with this indirect searches, where actually, as I said, so you look at the uh, dark matter dense or uh, some favorable patches in the sky, and their expectation is dark matter may annihilate or decay to produce some standard model state by looking at the uh, signature of those to some stable standard model states like gamma rays, neutrinos, proton. You, you could predict about dark matter standard model interaction state. Uh, since our universe is full, I mean, full of uh, high energetic phenomena, so uh, I mean, we can we can we can expect that uh, such a heavy dark matter uh, could be searched to, through such astrophysical environments. So, in specifically, what I'll be uh, looking at is this this uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the recently observed sub PV diffuse gamma rays by TBT is gamma collaboration, which I'll be discussing in detail in my talk. Uh, and and in the next, I mean, in the second scenario, what we'll be looking at is the neutrinos that will be produced from captured dark matter annihilation in a galactic population of neutron star. So this is the brief outline of my talk. So I'll first give you a theorist view of activity as comma experiment, what it is observing, how it is observing. Uh, then we'll try to see whether uh, we could do some searches for dark matter through that observation or not. We'll be specifically exploring the decaying dark matter scenario. Then I'll be talking about this neutrinos that will be produced from captured dark matter annihilation. And we'll see that in both of the scenarios might be able to probe new region of the dark matter parameter space. So this is a this is sorry, this is the view of this Tibet AS comma experiment. Uh, it is situated actually Tibet, China. Uh, this is Chinese Japanese collaboration. It is around 4,300 meter above the sea level. The effective area of the experiments is around four times of the uh, four times the cross section of uh, city opera house and <clears throat> each of the white color thing that you could see over here is actually a scintillator detector there are 597 such scintillator detector each of having area half a meter square uh, so what this scintillator detector do is uh, once cosmic rays come interact with the atmosphere it would produce air sour so it would consist of like gamma rays uh, gamma rays electron positron and other things the scintillator detector are trying to detect those particles uh, as I said, this is actually, uh, this is trying to detect high energy gamma rays. So you need to have something which could differentiate between gamma rays and uh, cosmic rays, which are mainly proton. So that's why they kind of hybridize the detector. Uh, that's why they call it as uh, Tibet ERSR and, and muon detector. So in this in this figure, what you could see is, is that the black square thing is the uh, 
scintillator detector, which is same as the white color thing that you, you have seen in the earlier slide. And in each of these four green panel below each scintillator detector, there are water channel commune detector, which are placed underground, 2.4 meter underground. Uh, that's why this is a kind of hybridized detector. And uh, in that water channel commune detector, you could detect muons of energy. I mean, muons of energy one greater than one GB could, uh, could be detected there. Uh, these muon detectors are quite important because, as I will see, uh, I mean, it, it would help us to differentiate between uh, gamma rays and cosmic rays. This is their lifetime. I mean, uh, uh, for 719 days, they have taken the data, which is February 2014 to 2017. Uh, so before going to discuss how it is differentiating between cosmic rays and gamma rays, uh, let us try to answer, uh, answer the question, what is it observing? So the short answer to that question is actually, high energy gamma rays. And why are you interested in high energy gamma rays? Because gamma rays being charge neutral uh, would not be deflected by any intergalactic magnetic field. So it would point back to the source. So, so, so in that sense, it, it, is, it would be easy to, uh, uh, I mean, easy to see that source. So, uh, and one such source of high energy gamma rays is given in the right panel figure. So what you could see over here is, is let's say, this is a cosmic ray source. Uh, which a priori you don't know. Cosmic rays being, I mean, most, mostly proton, it travels in a zigzag path. Once it interacts with uh, interstellar nucleus, it would produce charge and neutral pions. And the neutral pion would essentially decay to photon. Once this photon comes to the atmosphere, it would produce a air sour particle, something like this. And this is what you are trying to detect in the Earth space observation. So this is, I mean, this is one possible source of such high energy gamma rays, namely the hadronic source. Uh, so this is what this debate is come experiment is actually trying to detect. Uh, another point that I want to emphasize here is if you observe a, let's say, photon of energy 100 TV, that would essentially predict a galactic origin of TV, so TV scale cosmic ray because of something called attenuation. So a, a photon of energy 100 TV could not produce outside our galaxy. So because of the interaction, uh, I mean, pair production interaction, because of those interaction, so if you observe a 100 TB proton, then that means a, you can say that uh, there is a galactic origin of TB scale cosmic rays, which sometimes known as pivot trans. So the bottom line here is to understand the cosmic ray physics better. And then comes to the point is how we differentiate between uh, photon and proton sour. So in the, to, to guide your eye, in the left panel, I show you the uh, uh, air sour particle that will be produced by a primary gamma rays, the gamma ray comes, interact with the atmosphere to produce electron positron pair. Then essentially at the end of the shower, you, you produce electron positrons and gamma rays. Uh, but in the cosmic ray shower, along with this electron positron gamma ray, there are a whole lot of particles like ions, muons, and neutrinos. But in the context of this debate is gamma experiments, these muons are quite important because that's what they have used to differentiate between uh, cosmic rays and uh, gamma ray shower. By looking at these two figure, one may assume that uh, uh, primary gamma rays are, do not have any muons, but that is not true because you could have occasional gamma p interaction, which would give rise, give rise to hadronic sour, which is similar to this. So this makes, makes the life difficult because uh, you need to have efficient discriminator so that you could differentiate between uh, these two sour. Uh, to emphasize the point in a bit more detail, so what I am showing over here is uh, a, the air sour that would be produced by a 200 TB uh, 200 TB gamma rays in the upper panel, and yes, how that will be produced by a 200 TB proton in the lower panel. So, the, so I mean, the red color lines in both the panels represents electrons, yellow color lines represents positrons, and the blue color lines represents muons. So, as you could see, uh, the electron actually, uh, I mean, muons doesn't lose energy that efficiently as compared to uh, electrons. Uh, the, 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 the energy lo uh, energy losing is uh, if I remember correctly, it is proportional to one by m square. So since this muon has higher mass as compared to electrons, so that's why it doesn't lose energy that efficiently. So that's why these uh, muons could travel through the ground to the underground detector, but the, most of the electron positron could not travel the detector. So that's why uh, uh, this is this yes, our muon detector is actually quite important to differentiate between uh, cosmic rays and gamma rays. And the other point over here is, as you as you compare these two figures, you will see that 
uh, there are large number of muons in the proton sour as compared to the gamma ray sour. So TVET actually utilize these factors to differentiate between uh, cosmic ray and gamma ray sour. Uh, so just to show you the things over here. So in, in this plot, uh, what, I have, what, what have been plotted is the number of muons above one GB in the x-axis and the probability of getting that muon is in the y-axis. Uh, the the, uh, uh, the the probability of getting that muons from the gamma ray sour is uh, de depicted by this line, and probability of getting that muons from the cosmic uh, proton sour is depicted by this line. So let's say in the experiment, if you if you put a cart over here, let's say you are observing a muons numbers with less than hundred, then essentially you are keeping twenty percent of your gamma ray flux, but a uh, but discriminating. I mean, uh, you are leaving a I mean, large, uh, leaving large part of the cosmic ray sour. So what you essentially want to do is uh, you want to optimize this cut so that you get rid of most of the cosmic ray flux and you essentially left with this uh, gamma ray flux. This is what Tibet do to differentiate between cosmic ray and gamma ray sour. And ultimately their survival ratio for the cosmic rays and gamma rays are presented in this manner in the, uh, in the, uh, the experimental collaboration has presented their result in this manner. So what have been plotted here is the reconstructed energy in the x-axis and the survival ratio in the um, y-axis. So this black color lines is the survival ratio for the uh, cosmic rays, and this um, and this blue color lines is actually the survival ratio for the gamma rays. So if you are in this regime, like it's hundreds and hundreds of TB and TB regime, that's what uh, we are interested in. So in that regime, the uh, survival ratio for the proton is almost around 10 power minus five or six, and the corresponding number for the uh, corresponding survival ratio for the gamma ray is actually ordered one number. So, so essentially, what you are left with is the gamma ray flux, and along with that, what Tibet can do is it can measure the arrival direction of the photons. Uh, so, in, in these three plots, what in these three plots, what have been uh, plotted is is the gamma ray like events for three different uh, energy beams that they observe. Like in this energy beams, this is 100 to 158 TeV, 158 to 398 TeV, 390 to 2000 TeV. Uh, so the shaded region is the region that uh, Tibet cannot look at. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, black solid line is the uh, galactic plane. This is something called equatorial coordinate system. That's why this lies along this line. And each of the blue colors things that you could see here actually represents a gamma ray-like events. Uh, as you could see, in the lowest energy beam, we have large number of events uh, compared to the, uh, the, the 158 to 398 TV beams. So, so the point here is that as the energy increases, the gamma ray flux is decreased. That's why you are observing less number of uh, gamma ray-like events. Uh, another important point over here is that if you look at this panel, this figure, and you could see that along with blue lines, there are actually uh, uh, red colored points, which actually represents the known TV sources. What their claim is that uh, most of the uh, most of the gamma ray events that they are observing are not overlapping with known TV sources. That's why the uh, they are not as the, the, the gamma ray sources that or gamma ray events that they are observing are not associated with any sources. They are like orphan. So that's why they call it as a diffuse gamma ray sources. Uh, so diffuse gamma ray events. And to, I mean, to further see this, what they have plotted in this figure, what have been plotted is the distance to the closest TV sources in the x-axis and number of events that you observe is in the y-axis. As you could see, the closest, I mean, the distance to the closest TV sources is almost one degree, uh, angular distance is almost one degree in the sky. So, so, so the, their essential claim, claim is that they observe high energy gamma rays and those gamma rays are not associated, or gamma ray events are not associated in any particular sources. So that's why they call it as a diffuse sources. And next come, what is the observed flux? So, so for that, the collaboration has presented their result in these two different energy, uh, these two different uh, uh, angular region. And th this is the first one, this is the second one. And what have been presented here is the energy in the x-axis and differential gamma ray flux in the y-axis. Uh, so the red color points that you could see over here is the, uh, the gamma ray flux that have been observed by the experiment uh, and corresponding energies as given by 121 to 20 and 534 TV. Uh, this, uh, 
this black colors, black solid, black lines that you could see over here is the gamma ray flux that have been predicted by different cosmic ray theoretical models. Uh, for example, if you if you look at this black solid line, this is actually something called uh, space dependent cosmic ray model. Like if you take this space uh, space independent cosmic ray model and calculate the gamma ray flux for that model, uh, the corresponding gamma ray flux is given by this. So each of these black color lines represents uh, gamma ray flux that have been predicted by different cosmic ray theoretical models. Uh, the blue colors things that you could this blue color. Uh, or blue colored points that you could see over here is what have been observed by Argo observation. And you could see that within even two decades, there are no observation. So that's why this is first detection of sub PV diffuse gamma rays. Uh, in the right panel, again, the, uh, the, the same thing have been plotted, but the uh, point here is that, uh, I mean, along with red points that you could see a, a downheaded down blue colored points, uh, downheaded blue color things, which is actually represents the upper limit in the gamma ray flux that have been given by the Kasami experiment. They have not observed anything. That's why they put an upper bound in the gamma ray flux. Uh, so by looking at these two figure, so sorry. So by, by looking at these two figure, so I mean, what one could see is the uh, different cosmic ray theoretical models matches oil with your data or matches roughly oil with your data. And even after this experimental collaboration has presented their, uh, published their result, uh, there are several proposals, uh, like you could look at these papers where they have actually tried to uh, feed the data with, uh, I mean, several theoretical models. So given this, so you observe gamma rays and, uh, and different cosmic, uh, the gamma ray flux that have been predicted by different cosmic theoretical models uh, matches uh, roughly oil with your data. So then, the question that we are, we asked whether this observation could be used to search for dark matter or not. Specifically, you have explored the decay. Is there any question? Hello. Uh, someone was just on uh, on unmuted. Oh, so I... oh, okay, 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 okay. It's fine. Yeah. So yeah. So whether that could be used to search for dark matter or not. So we have explored the two-body decaying dark matter scenario. Uh, Professor Celine Boehm is kind of um, leading expert in this uh, in this searches. Uh, uh, so, so what we find is that uh, we could not find any uh, any signal for the dark matter. Rather, what we, what, what we could find is the stringent constant in the uh, dark matter parameter space. Uh, so given a dark matter is taking to a two-body standard, uh, two uh, standard model state, how do you calculate the gamma ray flux? Just, just a brief overview. So let's say this is where you're observing, I mean, where you're observing, let's say it is at a distance r from the source where dark matter is decaying. If dark matter lifetime is much, much larger than the age of the universe, this is kind of in equilibrium. So you could calculate what could be the decay rate per unit time, which is given by this. Then if you assume that per, per decay you are producing one observable particle and if your detector area is A, then the number of particles that you are going to observe per unit time uh, is given by this. Uh, then you can just do some algebra and you end up with this. Then if you assume that, uh, 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 from the production to reception, the energy of the gamma rays are not changing or energy of the particles that you are producing are not changing. And you do the line of sight integration so that you take care of a whole lot of volume that you could see. Then the number of particles that you, you would observe per unit area per unit time is given by this. This is something called uh, DK, uh, J DK or DK fast sometimes this is also called D, uh, uh, D factor. So this is either Z factor or D factor. In case of decay, it's known as, uh, sometimes known as D factor. Uh, so uh, in principle, you are not producing one observable particle per decay. So uh, there will be like a spectrum particle, like uh, number of particles per, uh, you are producing some spectra for the particles. And also uh, energy might change uh, from the production to reception. So if you essentially take care of all those factors, so the, your, your, your final formula becomes this. So this e to the power tau, or e to the power tau factor is actually taking care of the attenuation because of the, let's say, interaction of gamma rays which are producing at the source and while coming to the observer. So you need to, cal I mean, you need, need to take care of uh, all this factor. Then you, what you can get is a, a gamma ray flux that will be produced from, let's say, dark matter decay. The things that I have not discussed is this attenuation and this spectra. So this spectra you can actually calculate from the uh, any of the publicly available code. Uh, 
so the essentially the point here is that let's say this sky is a dark matter, which is decaying to some two bodies, standard model states, let's say quark quark bar, and this quark get hadronized to produce pi zero, so it essentially decays to gamma rays. And this publicly available code like PVPC, HDM spectra would just um, just give you the what could be the gamma ray spectrum for the, those kind of decay or anhydrism. Uh, we have actually used the results of this HDM spectra, which is quite recently developed. And uh, our results actually doesn't differ much. If you, you, even if you use the PPPC, it's kind of 10% different in between these two. So we have calculated this, uh, the gamma ray spectrum from HDM spectra itself. Uh, then coming back to the, this attenuation factor, the essentially physics over here is this, if this is the gamma rays that you're producing from let's say dark matter decay, uh, then that may interact with some background photon, which could be either CMB, starlight, infrared, or maybe extra galactic, extra galactic background. Once it interact, that would pro uh, I mean that would pair produce like electron positrons, and the uh, attenuation you could calculate utilizing this formula. The essential physics here is that if the mean free path, which is actually uh, inversely proportional to gamma gamma interaction cross section and background density, uh, if the mean free path is the, the the length that the photon is traveling is larger than the mean free path, there will be uh, suppression in the gamma ray flux. But if it is uh, much, much smaller than this lambda, then, then there would not be any suppression. So, uh, so if you take CMB as the background photon and then calculate this factor, then the corresponding, I mean, the corresponding result is shown in this figure. So what I've been plotted here is in the x-axis, we have the energy of the photon. And in the y-axis, we have uh, this attenuation factor. As you could see, uh, in in the range of this hundreds and hundred TeV and an hour. So as you increase the length of the uh, length of the photon is traveling, there are much, much. I mean, you are getting larger and larger attenuation. So uh, as I said earlier, if you mix this L, let's say uh, our nearest and uh, nearest galaxy, which is Andromeda, which is around seven fifty kiloparsec away. So if you make this length to be seven fifty kiloparsec, uh, the, the the gamma ray flux will be almost around zero. So that's why I say that. If you produce a hundred TB, if you observe a hundred TB photon, then that must originate within our galaxy. That could not come outside our galaxy. Um, in principle, you need to include starlight and infrared, but uh, this, the number density for starlight and infrared thing is quite large. When you are looking at the uh, galactic center, this Tibet is come experiments is not really looking at the galactic center. So that's why that is not important to us. I mean, that is quite a subdominant factor that we have checked. So we have only done the attenuation factor with CMB. Once you include all this, so you can calculate what could be the gamma ray flux uh, from the dark matter decay. And that have been given over here. That delta omega is a region of view of the experiments. MK is the dark matter mass. Tau chi is the dark matter lifetime. D in gamma D is the, 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 the spectra for the dark matter, and rho chi is the uh, dark matter density, which we have taken to be NFW profile. And this is the attenuation factor, is just the reduction in the flux due to that interaction that I have just discussed. So once you calculate the gamma ray flux, uh, gamma ray flux from the dark matter decay, then, then as I said, the cosmic ray physics is there, and you need to, uh, I mean, you, we don't know which of the cosmic ray model is uh, true. So that's why you have taken three different background cosmic ray models, space independent, space independent, hybrid gamma ray model, which are there in this literature. So what you essentially want to ensure is to take the gamma ray flux from here and add it up with this, uh, uh, and take one of the cosmic ray background model and take the gamma ray flux from there, just add it up to see uh, the region of the parameter, the region of the dark matter parameter space where your observed flux is much, much less, or observed flux is not overshooting the data. So data is given by this. These are the energy beam that I have discussed and these are the three representative energy uh, that I have plotted in that flux plot. And these are the observed fluxes for two different region of view of the experiment. So what you wasn't want to ensure is decaying dark matter flux plus background should be less than what have been observed by the TBTS come experiment. So what we did is we did a simple chi-square analysis and uh, this is our result where dark matter mass is in the x-axis and dark matter lifetime is in the y-axis. This is for a particular channel where dark matter is decaying to BB bar. And these three different solid lines corresponds to space independent, space dependent, and hybrid gamma ray model. For example, this hybrid gamma ray model is represented by this green line and space dependent cosmic ray model is represented by this 
I mean, the bound that you are uh, that you are obtaining with this kind, this three different background is uh, represented by three different solid lines, and and this uh, dashed line is actually represents the bounds that is there uh, already there in the literature, like uh, in this smaller dark matter mass, like in in this range, the uh, the the bound is mostly coming from Fermilab, and in this higher masses, it is actually mostly coming from the ice cube observation. So. These lines actually means anything above the, for each of the line, anything above the line is allowed and anything below the line is actually excluded by this corresponding observation. So that means this is the, if, if these are the true model for the cosmic rays, like this space dependent or hybrid gamma rays model, a true model for the cosmic rays, then this is the new region of the parameter space that you'll be able to probe to, we have been able to probe through this observation. Um, while this, this result we have presented for a particular decay channel where dark matter is decaying to BB bar, uh, you couldn't, we have actually, uh, I mean, uh, done the calculation for other channels also. And our conclusion is that for most of the channels, except for first two generation of leptons, our bounds are stronger than the previous bounds. Uh, then one may ask whether our bounds depends on the uh, dark matter density profile or not. Uh, so since this debate is come experiment is not looking at the galactic center, dark matter density profiles are uh, different near the galactic center. So that's why our bound doesn't depends on the uh, different dark matter density profile. So in that sense, you could say it to be uh, robust. So with this, let me move on to the other part where I'll be discussing this neutrinos that will be produced from capture dark matter annihilation. Uh, so let me, uh, briefly said a few words about what is dark matter capture. Let's say this is a celestial body. And because of the steep gravitational potential of the celestial body, a dark matter mass of m chi velocity u uh, could come, uh, could gravitationally attract it towards the celestial body. And when it, reached, when it reached the surface of the body, its velocity should be something like this. And then if you assume that dark matter is talking to some standard model states, uh, then because of, uh, because I mean, uh, standard model state within the celestial body, let's say nucleon in the, within the uh, neutron star, then what happens is that because of the interaction, dark matter may lose energy. And if the final velocity of the dark matter is less than the escape velocity of the object, so within the object, roughly you could calculate uh, this, is the flux, uh, this is the part where you have the dark matter flux, like here the dark matter number density, and Dark matter day. Hello. Yeah, we're losing you, Doug. So shall I go ahead or we, we is there any problem? I think the connection is not always very good, at least mine. I don't know. Yeah, you were bad for a while, but you're better again now. Uh, Hello. I think you might be dropping in and out. Yeah. Uh, your your video is frozen on the on our screen. Uh, you're back. I think you're back now. I'm sorry for this. I, I, actually, I I did not realize this. I think we we heard most of it, but it's just the last few. Um, yeah, the last few words that you say. Maybe I should uh, I should uh, stop my video then. Is it? Uh, yeah, that's the husband. Yeah. For this, yeah, I I did not realize this. No. So the essentially, uh, essentially, you could calculate the capture rate utilizing this equation. Also, dark matter uh, distribution. It also depends. It does mean whether uh, after the interaction, the final velocity is uh, uh, less than the escape velocity of the capture rate. I mean, a large class of signature that uh, that are, uh, that could be available, but uh, for annihilating dark matter, what you could get is kind of heating signature where the state 
uh, uh, it leads to the heating of the object, these people are exploding. Looking at is that the complementary where uh, dark matter and highlight to produce, let's say, long lived mediator, which are being long lived and weakly interactive, uh, comes out of the uh, uh, some standard models that you were observing, like gamma rays and neutrinos. Specifically, what we'll be exploring over here is the gamma ray signature. People have explored the uh, Uh, so, uh, so, so as I said, so we have considered a dark. We have instead of uh, considering a uh, dark matter capture in a single neutron star, we have considered a, and considered dark matter capture in a galactic population of neutron star, uh, and the corresponding algorithm like to to get the neutrino flux is given over here. Uh, dark matter may annihilate to produce long lived mediator. Then, uh, then those long lived mediator just come out of the object to produce standard model state. And from there, you are producing neutrinos. And such kind of long lived mediators are actually uh, appears in a uh, large class of dark matter models like secluded dark matter models, dark photon dark matter models, other things. So once you have this, so the time evolution of the uh, dark matter number density inside the neutron star, you could calculate utilizing this equation uh, where C total is the total capture rate, C annihilation is the annihilation rate. And once you assume that, uh, assume the system to be in equilibrium, that means that the amount of dark matter those uh, capture are also getting annihilated, then the annihilation rate is given by this, where, uh, where this is uh, uh, this is the, this total capture rate and this half factor is given by, given due to the, uh, I mean, you need to have two dark matter to annihilate to produce uh, uh, long lived mediator. That's why this half factor is there. So once you do this, you can calculate this neutrino flux, which is given by this, uh, this tau annihilation depends on dark matter mass. And I mean, this, this is essentially determined by the capture rate, which depends on dark matter mass and dark matter neutron cross section. This D is the uh, distance between the object and the uh, observer. And this is the branching ratio uh, to which this media is taking to standard model states. Uh, this is the uh, neutrino spectrum that we get and this is a survival ratio, which essentially determines whether uh, the, the, the neutrinos that are producing from such scenario is getting attenuated or sorry, getting uh, attenuated because of the, or maybe the mediator, which is uh, producing from the dark matter annihilation is getting attenuated uh, due to the atmosphere of the neutron star or not. Once you include all these factors, you could calculate the neutrino flux, uh, which have been plotted, uh, the neutrino flux have been plotted in this figure where uh, in the x-axis we have the neutrino energy and in the y-axis we have a uh, uh, neutrino flux. Uh, uh, the, the, the different solid lines is actually for uh, different standard model state, which, which mediator is coupled to. For example, this black lines represents the state where mediator directly couples to neutrinos. And you have some other states like BB bar, W plus, and all other things are there. So, uh, and, and, and in this kind of searches, uh, there are background neutrinos, which actually uh, um, consist of this astrophysical and atmospheric neutrinos. Astrophysical neutrinos recently discovered by Ice Cube. And these atmospheric neutrinos, again, the cosmic ray comes, interact with the atmosphere. And it, from, from the air side, you are producing those neutrinos. This is what this atmospheric neutrinos is. We have taken these fluxes from these two paper. And what you essentially want to ensure is uh, 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 the parameters for the, I mean, so if you want to set a bound of the dark matter parameter space, what, what we have essentially ensured is the, the number of events that you are observing from the signal that is from the dark matter is same as what, what you could observe from the astrophysical atmospheric plus. You just add up those two pluses and then the observed number of events from those backgrounds should be same as the signal number of events. By that, we have actually uh, set our limits. And in particular, what we have uh, taken is the uh, track-like events because we are we are really looking at the uh, narrow region in the sky. So in I mean, broadly there could be two signatures. One is uh, neutrinos comes and interact with nucleons. Let's say through charge current interaction that would produce let's say muon neutrino comes interact with nucleons through charge current interaction it would produce muons. Uh, as I said, muons doesn't lose uh, um, that it, it lose energy that efficiently. That's why it produces a track like signature. Uh, 
But for the other interaction, it would produce a cascade like signature, but angular resolution of the cascade is not that very good. So that's why you have uh, taken into account uh, this only this uh, track like signature over here. Uh, and we are looking at very narrow region in the sky. So around the galactic center. So if you just calculate this uh, number of uh, track like num track events from both from the signal and the background events, and then just equate it to uh, uh, we, we, we then just equate it to get the constraint, which have been plotted in this figure, where dark matter mass is in the x-axis, dark matter nucleon cross-section is in the y-axis. So as you could see, this direct, the extrapolated direct detection bounds are over here, and there are some other uh, some other bounds, like here you, you look at the similar signature uh, from the dark matter capture in a sun uh, through, uh, through Hawk, and here you have uh, to a galactic population of neutron star in his, and as you could see, if you look at the neutrino signature over here, you, you would be able to probe this new region of the dark matter parameter space. It depends on the uh, uh, depends on the standard model coupling, which is mediated have. Uh, for this BB bar, we are getting this limit. For neutrino channel, we are getting this limit. The essentially, bottom line over here is that with this, we have been able to probe new region of the dark. We possibly would, would be able to probe a uh, new region of the dark matter parameter space. Uh, with this, let me conclude. So gamma rays and neutrinos being charged neutron are extremely, I mean, extremely useful messenger for the uh, dark matter searches. Here we have looked into the two scenarios. In one case, we have looked into the <coughs> high energy gamma ray searches to Tibet S gamma experiment, <coughs> where, which, which has actually observed sub PV gamma rays from the galactic bees. We have utilized that uh, result to search for the decaying dark matter scenario. We could not find any signal for the dark matter. The other what we could find is the uh, strong constant in the uh, dark matter parameter space. In another scenario, we have looked into the neutrinos that would be produced from dark matter capture uh, in a galactic population of neutron star. And there you'd also see this by looking at those neutrinos, we might be able to probe a new region of the dark matter parameter space. And importantly, uh, the, the scenario that I have discussed through that, we have actually able to probe a uh, complementary region of the dark matter parameter space. Uh, okay, thanks for your attention. I don't know how much my signal has dropped, so. Uh, yeah, it was just for a little while. Um, that was, yeah, you're fine now. Um, yeah, okay, thank you very much, um, Tarek, for a very nice talk. Um, do we have some questions from the audience for Tarek? Yes, please go ahead. I mean, if, if something is not clear from my part, maybe you can also ask that again. Mm -hmm. I mean, from signal actually. Maybe, maybe I can start. Um, could you go back to slide eight, 18? Yes. Um, I, I was just a bit confused about um, the, the fields of view here. So you've got like a galactic longitude between 25 and 100 degrees, but then you have galactic latitude less than five degrees. Which yes. I'm surprised you would do for a dark matter search because you, that's where the disk, the galactic disk is. Wouldn't you want to look out of the galactic disk rather than in the galactic disk for, for dark matter? Can you repeat the last part of your question? I mean, why you are getting better limit? That that, that is your question. Well, because you have a you'd have a lower background when you were you, the D factor or the decay factor would be kind of the same if you looked out of the hmm. out of the disk, but you'd have a much lower um, galactic background. Do you know why why you chose those uh, fields of view? Were they were they given to you by the tip? Why by why them? they? Uh, I mean, no. So so this is not we have chosen. Actually, the collaboration has presented their result in this. I mean, they have presented their result in this two region of view of the experiment. I mean, why do they chosen that? Actually, we have asked that question to to one of the experimentalists, but they they, they doesn't have any clear answer. To this question, so uh, okay. Um, so, since this collaboration has presented in this result, that's why you have explored this. And uh, probably when you look at this, since this is not near the galactic center, so one may assume that uh, these are not going to give you the uh, better limits. Since we have some, I mean, some knowledge of background, which is not extremely good because we don't know which of the cosmic ray model is true. So once you include the cosmic ray models. Then actually, you are you will be able to probe a new region for the dark matter parameter space or new properties of the dark matter. So since this is an observation, this is not kind of upper limit or something like that. So that's why I mean, 
So could they just could add the bounds stand to improve if you use the full the full data across the whole sky or the the the, the I mean so but in their paper, like in the experimental collaboration paper, I mean for the observed plots, they have presented in this manner. And then for the like uh to, to just show it to be diffuse and all other things, they have just presented this. That's it. I mean, beyond this. Uh, I, I don't know, as a theorist, I, we do not have any access to them, any other things. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, are there any other questions before I go on? Maybe, um, I mean, since you have all those data, I mean, you, you're using them to constrain the dark matter, but I was wondering if, um, is there anyone who uses the data simply to constrain the, the flux of gamma, I mean, the flux of neutrinos or gamma, or yeah, gamma rays, as you put. Um, independently of the of the dark matter, because it could be done, as Karen said, because it's so um, it's so close to the center, it could be just general limits uh, on the cosmic ray in the um, coming from the disk. Yeah. So essentially, you are talking about whether people have explored different kind of cosmic ray model in this aspect or not. Yeah. It, 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 okay. Then that actually people have done. Like you can look at these papers, or oh, yeah. like can share with you this paper. And there is a whole lot of papers actually. Yeah, at least 10, 15 papers where people have explored these things. Different kind of model, like people have explored le leptonic uh, scenario where like inverse Compton is producing, you are producing high energy electron, then that uh, that interact with uh, CMB and that is producing high energy gamma rays from there. So people have like explored different kind of scenarios to explain the data itself. But we were trying I to, yeah, we were trying to explain it, just trying to constrain, you know, the different the kind of, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that I'm not very sure. Maybe I, I can share you the papers. Uh, I, I'm not expert on these things or I have not looked at those things in detail. Okay. So I'll check that and maybe send you the papers. And, and maybe another point is if um, it's really hard to, to get deviations of the CMB spectrum, but I was wondering if, um, if you have an excess for whatever reason, then I guess I would modify the um, that would modify the results, so that that might be worth. I mean, I'll use with you more, but that might be worth exploring. Anyway, yes, that was yes. just a comment. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Bruce. Uh, so thank you for the talk. While while we're here, can you just go back to slide eleven? Yes. Um, and can you just explain again the discussion in the bottom right because oh i see so you've the, got this you've got these two different models one's isotropic and one's diffuse mm -hmm. and two curves and you've highlighted this very close area and it just went by a little quickly can we run that again oh i see so the, the point here is that i mean what they are trying to essentially uh, point out is whether they are uh, the gamma ray events that they are observing is diffuse or not whether they are associated with any source or not. That is the essential point. So to do yeah. that, what they did is in the x-axis, they have plotted distance to the closest TV sources. And in the x-axis, we have distance to the closest TV sources. And in the y-axis, we have number of events. As you could see, the for this energy beam, for the highest energy beam, this is for highest energy. As you could see, data is uh, 398 TV greater than that. So for the highest energy beam, they have plotted the data over here. As you could see, distance to the closest TV sources, I mean, the smallest distance to the closest TV sources is almost one degree in the sky. So that's why their claim is this, this is a this is a diffuse signal. And the other point is, I mean, these are the like uh, number of events that you could get from different kind of cosmic ray models, like isotropic Monte Carlo, diffuse uh, diffuse model, due, I mean, uh, doing the Monte Carlo things. This, this, these are the like number of events that you could get from background cosmic ray models. So so it's based it, it's based on the comparison between these two models and in the first instance. And isotropic means what? Isotropic means isotropic on four pi. It means equal so, in the disk so of that, the galaxy. That, that, what? Oh so uh, probably that that means this I'm not very sure about it. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe I need to look at Tibet's yes. paper. Yeah, I mean, so the, the point is, I mean, these are the two different models for the 
for the gamma refluxes. That's what they have used. But what does isotropic mean here? That, that I have not checked it very carefully. Okay, I'm sorry for this. Maybe I, I can scale uh, I, I should check their paper perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyone else? Uh, maybe I can go. So the um, slide 25, uh, where you're doing the annihilation inside uh, the mm -hmm. start. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, do you, what is the, do you need to, what, what is the mediator that you're assuming here? So this Y? No, I mean, are you talking about whether it is scalar or something? I mean, yeah. or something? No, I mean, this is just model independent thing. So if you have a mod mediator, which is, let's say, uh, talking to standard model set with some branching ratio, then that would do the job. Uh, and it, it must have long lived and also weakly interacting so that it could come out of the object. There is, uh, we are not talking about any particular model over here. So does it, okay, does it not depend on, on that or? No, it doesn't depend on whether it is scalar, mediator, I mean, scalar, family, or vector. But how, how does the, does the, like the dark matter Y annihilation mm -hmm. cross section, is that, does that not enter into it? Some, some yes, 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 sure. So the, the, this cross section is probably fixed it to 10 power minus 46 centimeters square or something like that. I mean, for these products at least. Uh, okay, but it doesn't matter what, what the Y actually is. Well, presumably, what if, the, if the Y is, if you did come up with some model, they would. Be, uh, like yes. they'd run into like stellar bounds or, or something. Is it, or, or... That, that may happen. That may happen. I mean, depending on the mediator mass, it could happen. Yeah, yeah. But but we, we, we are talking about mediator of masses, let's say 100 TB or so. Will there be any stellar bound over there? Oh, not, not a stellar bound. There would be, uh, you may have some cosmological bounds of some kind. Yes. Um, but I'm not sure. I mean, you, yeah, like if you have very long lived mediator, if it, if it it could spoil BBN and another thing. So you need to take care of, once you enter into this particular model, then you need to take care of all these phenomenological aspects. Um, and then the, the last thing, so the, um, the slides after this, so the, when you're talking about the, the constraints or the, the projections, <laughs> um, I, I think I just missed what the detector was. Um, because you look, it's a neutrino detector, presumably that's looking for. Yes, yeah, it, it's absolutely, but yeah. Is it like a like an ice cubes style thing? Is yes. that what you're envisioning? Okay. But it's, I okay, mean, it could be either ice cube or, game. or oh, sorry. Yeah, so it could be either ice cube or game in it. I mean, detection principle is absolutely same. Like, uh, uh, so if you have a mu neutrino, which let's say if it is a charge card interaction that would produce a muons and that muons will produce a track like signature. and Except that if you have, let's say, electron neutrinos, whether you have charge current or neutral current interaction, you will have a cascade like signature. And since we are all looking at a very small region in around the galactic center, and track like signature does have better angular resolution as compared to cascade like events. So that's why you are choosing it to be, I mean, we are only considering track like events. Cascade would not do uh, too better over here. And, and I mean, uh, since we are looking at the galactic centers, so uh, I, I mean, came through it would came through it would do better as compared to ice cube because uh, probably for came through it around thirty seven percent of their uh, uh, lifetime actually they uh, uh, they can look look into the galactic center through the earth. So yeah. the, then then cosmic rays may only be I mean uh, it, it could reduce the background over there, but for the ice cube uh, that would not be the case. So in that case, you need to use beta and all other things to uh, observe those neutrinos. Uh, so what did you assume for the detector? So what exposure time or what? Oh, that, so that, size uh, gigaton that I can read. So uh, yeah, so that uh, I have for like, like typical, uh, typical uh, gigaton like detector. I mean, I exactly forgot the number for this T mm -hmm. and all other things, but, but would be then 10 years typical, and... typical, yes, yes. Could could Ice Cube already do this, or or do you need something? What's the mass of so, Ice Cube? <laughs> I mean, yeah, for for Ice Cube, what you need to do is you need to put some veto so that I mean you get rid of atmospheric neons mm. oh, because okay. you are looking at the galactic center and uh, probably for whole time of the Ice Cube, you I mean it, it, it would not look I mean Ice Cube would not look at the galactic center through R. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why you need to put some veto over there. Like you need to consider some inner volume of the ice cube so that you get rid of atmospheric muons and observe these neutrinos. Yeah, okay. 
but games you need to do uh, do better um all right so if we've exhausted the questions i think we can uh close the session there i'll stop recording <laughs>